Okay, welcome everyone. So I'm, I'm actually happy to have uh, this year uh, two talks on the topic of real-time KVM, real-time virtualization. Um, so I'm going to continue basically uh, at the point where Rick was dealing with the low-level stuff with more high-level things and up to uh, the management layer. Um, but I would also like to give some short introduction, basically, um, to well, the structure of, the, of my presentation, um, real-time KVM for the masses. So I'll talk a little bit about the motivation, expand the space a little bit, and the requirements, um, come up with a reference architecture that we would propose for the first steps, um, just to move forward. Um, look on the compute node side setup, um, so picking up a lot of what, what Rick was presenting, acquainting it a bit, and then look into um, OpenStack adaption that are required um, to manage such kind of virtual machines um, with this management layer. So we already heard about uh, one typical use case scenario for, for uh, real-time virtualization, um, communication systems, switching systems, everyone is talking about NFV and things like this. Um, there's also trading systems where uh, it's about uh, real low latency and uh, it's really about money in this case. And from our domain, um, there come in the control systems of all kind, um, which are, yeah, for various reasons now being considered as virtualizable or to be virtualized. Um, reasons like the consolidation of physical machines, um, hardware standardization, simpler maintenance, and also faster failover scenarios. Basically all the same. Um, in the details, of course, are some differences. So we only learned this early this morning that real-time KVM is working. Cool. So next question, of course, is can I have this in my cloud? <laughs> and well, as our project internally is also earlier as this real-time cloud, uh, we get this kind of questions all the time. And they say, oh, real-time cloud's no problem. You can have, of course. And then we talk further, and oh, you want to do I.O. Yeah, that's actually the problem. <laughs> Um, because even if you have your cloud deployment enabled for real time and you're running time critical sensitive workload there, you usually have um, some physical process somewhere else. And this somewhere else is actually a problem which is blocking this kind of thing where you have your real time cloud on the one side of the ocean and the process on the other side. Uh, you know the latencies, you probably get all those kind of links. Um, they might be fine for some scenarios of uh, real-time control because real-time is not just about real fast. It can also be real slow, uh, but deterministic. But anyway, um, also, even if the link is just slow, it may also be indeterministic. So these kind of scenarios are not yet really likely. Same scenario, or same problem you have if your target system is a bit more mobile and maybe the link is also uh, instable or just thin connection. So you really have to talk about what is realistic in this scenario. Um, and this is basically, as KVM is now real-time capable, defined uh, by closing the loop over the process. So starting with the data acquisition you have in what form ever in the physical world, transferring the data to your real-time virtual machine, processing it there, generating some output, getting it back, and then applying it on the physical world. That's basically the loop you have to consider, and then you can think about what kind of uh, setups, deployment remain, and there are, well, basically things what we call private cloud, local data center, or kind of whatever kind of server clusters you run virtualization on you want to deploy your virtual machines on close to the physical process that you want to enable. Um, and these kind of real-time virtual machines will require, naturally, some I.O. access, um, and that is usually connected, in our domain at least, with some special, more special networks. So it can be either some isolated uh, standard networks, um, it can be some specialized real-time ethernets, there are many on this on the field, or even if you think about the older installations, some field buses, 
special proprietary interfaces to get to the physical world. And they need to be attached somehow. So basically, to enable real time, um, we first of all have to define a little bit our scope. And we already learned that, for example, QEMO is not a good idea to have in this loop. And although I was talking about these kind of scenarios in the past, um, it was still a tough job. We made quite a good progress on this, but it's still something if we want to go for a really big um, deployment, uh, manageable deployment, we should exclude for the first steps, definitely. Also, one thing you have to think about was storage is probably not the first target you want to, uh, to address in the real-time setups. Um, well, we currently don't have a use case, um, urgent use case for this. We may have. Um, there's also the problem that the backends may not be that as deterministic as you need them to be. Um, so let's first of all don't think about this. Yeah, then also consolidate over some I.O. We could support all the world, but this, of course, is not manageable. So let's think about confining, uh, consolidating over Ethernet. It's a common denominator, basically. And for the things I mentioned, like the field passes, there are usually some gateways, some interfaces available, so you can all map them on, on some Ethernet variants. Device pass-through, often requested. Um, of course, there's some downside in the, in the cloud world. It may bind you to some physical nodes or things like this. For the real-time point of view, there are some complexity involved. Um, so let's first of all skip over this. We will come to this possibly later on. Another thing that people think about when they hear real-time and virtualization, uh, oh, virtualization means I can live migrate, cool. And now in real-time, um, yes, not really. Uh, people working in this area will probably uh, agree on this, that it is currently not designed, uh, the live migration mechanisms, to do any kind of things um, in real time, as long as the real time process is running. It's fine, basically, to shut down your virtual machine, to park it in a certain non-operational state, and then do the live migration, which will still accelerate a lot of things, uh, but not during operation. Let's exclude this. So this leaves us with a more yeah, manageable uh, a bill of material regarding the real-time needs we have. So we need real-time CPUs and we need real-time networking. Okay. But we also need something yet to manage this. And this is basically now where we came from. So we had some running uh, systems for quite a while um, to yeah, play with real-time KVM to enable certain setups. Uh, running various kind of guests inside of this, um, but it's all more or less handcrafted. The handcrafted deployment, the starter scripts, all the things. We have individual hosts. Um, we have some dozens VM per host, maybe at most. So, yeah, it's the lab setup. But we want to go, of course, bigger on the long run, so we want to go into some data centers. That means you have to manage hundreds of VMs. And some of them might be real-time, others may be non-real-time. Um, usually they come together to a certain degree. Um, you have to manage a lot of networks in this case. Um, specifically, as real-time is about isolation, there might be really large number of networks um, not really connected to each other. Um, yeah, and you also want to have flexible management for all this and also things of like accounting, for example. Various models could be imaginable in these kind of setups. So in the end, the requirements end up to something where you read um, yeah, a proper tooling for this, and, well, a cloud-grade, real-time capable management stack is required. And so we picked one, OpenStack, um, simply because, well, it's broadly used for private cloud setups or private cloud similar setups, and it has a good integration of KVM. There are others on the market, but let's say one has to be picked, and that's basically our choice. So let's look into some possible architecture with this kind of system. So as we learned, well, we have the physical hardware, the compute node, and of course we need Linux running with uh, param.t and kvn on top. Then we have some real-time guests, and we have QA mode somewhere. So the first thing that we learned, we need to partition. So we need to enable a certain set of CPUs, real-time CPUs on the compute hardware to isolate for, for real-time use so that the guests can use them exclusively with their real-time workload. But we still also need a little bit CPUs for other purposes like the emulation. So whenever the guest triggers something in QEMU, which is asynchronous, synchronous events will happen on the, on the yeah, CPU context, 
But the asynchronous things, Schema has a number of threads running in parallel. They have to run somewhere, and they don't, it shouldn't run on the real time cost, so they need some best effort cost remaining. Okay, so far so clear. Then, of course, we need some management stack. Make it simple. Um, well, in a larger deployment, you usually have some separate machines for this. There's the various services or open stack. I don't want to go into details here. Actually, I'm no expert on this. Um, I just learned it's complex. Um, but what you have is OpenStack, of course, as well, is something to control the compute node. And the usual stack looks like this, that you have uh, libvirt on the lowest level to talk to QEMO, do the management at this level. And on top, you have some, some local um, agent, Nova agent for the compute node, which is basically then instructing libvirt what to do. So that's the setup for real-time CPUs. What's missing here, of course, is the network, the I.O. So how to get this in? Well, we have some options to do um, I.O. and we already ruled them out. Emulation is not an option because it involves QEMO. Pass-through we want to exclude for now. So what leaves what's left basically is power virtualization in case of QEMO, KVM. That means that I.O. Okay. So we have a need for a real-time data plane now. So there are basically two options um, if you want to exclude QEMO doing this uh, data plane which we want to, that is vhost net in the host kernel, and this is, since recent development, vhost user, which is basically the same interface, uh, but then available to a separate user space process running on this host kernel. Uh, and we went for the second option. Simply um, because it's, well, from our point of view, currently more manageable, easier manageable. Um, so we, well, classic setup you have in this kind of scenario is uh, some yeah, data plane management kit. DPDK is uh, pretty popular uh, right now, and it even comes with an implementation um, for vhost user. Uh, simple setup, so it's quite easy to work with. Another advantage it has basically in this model is that you can, uh, if you're running the data plane dedicated course, you can do aggressive polling basically polling on the physical hardware that you want to connect to, but also polling on the virtual hardware that the guests will um, use and interact with. You just need basically one event channel if the guest is not polling as well, and that's basically the, the notification about incoming packages um, from this real-time switch router to the guest. And well, if we look at this, we were concerned initially it would be well, problematic regarding setup and configuration under real-time constraints, but actually it's a no-brainer. Um, what it is, it's just an, an IRQ FD, so it's an IO, uh, sorry, an event FD um, mechanism where the switch side just writes the event in form of a write sys call into this, and uh, on the guest side, basically, on the KVM side, um, just a uh, guest interrupt is injected into the real-time CPU. This path, does, you don't have to tune anything in this. It's very, very convenient, and it's very fast. So if we take this and can extend our architecture, well, the guest now has some virtual NIC for the real-time part. It may have further NICs for um, non-real-time communication purposes. And you have the physical NIC down there, uh, which is supposed to, oops, that's the wrong button. It was a anyway, um, and you have the physical NIC, which is supposed to connect you to the real-time world out there. So and in between, we now put um, some real-time data plane, um, exposing the vhost user interface, or using the vhost user interface. And yeah, that's basically the architecture that we well, proposed, basically, as um, a first step to also see what is possible based on this. So now we have to look in how to set this up on the compute node. So, well, we already learned about Prem.t has to run there, configuration, tuning. Well, I can just refer to what Rick was saying, the information available on the web, on the internet. One thing to add, basically, is the, um, is the power tuning, power management tuning. Um, it can also be done in the BIOS sometimes and have very interesting, nice, positive effects. So look into this. Otherwise, look into what Rick was suggesting. Um, then we have this topic of the uh, set, setup of the isolated CPU sets. Um, so basically we need two sets for real-time. Um, well, it can be one set, but it has to be logically split. 
One is for the virtual CPU threads, which are real-time, and one is for the real-time switching data plane threads. Can be one, can be many, depending on how big your setup is. Then we need, of course, sufficient non-isolated CPUs for the other workload, so anything which is related to management uh, tasks, management threads, um, and which is related to QEMO event threads. They should end up on these cores without any kind of special prioritization and isolation. What we also played with in the past was um, RCU, no callbacks, so it's basically a tuning thing. We played also for a while with the new no edge set stuff, but at that point, basically, it was not yet ready, um, and we had a bug that was fixed now regarding the interruption, but still you have, you shouldn't expect too much from me from my point of view because it's still, we have the one second tick with no edge set full. So that's, uh, from a deterministic point of view, it's actually not perfect yet. But, well, we will revalidate with a newer kernel. Right now we are on 3.18 with preemptor T. We will probably do a revalidation with a newer preemptor T kernel, how, what it delivers. Rick was already talking about um, an important thing is about the prioritization of your real-time vCPU and um, how they can basically manage um, yeah, the problem of starvation on the host system. So the kernel has a feature for this to avoid that a real-time thread can starve the host completely simply by running an infinite loop. Um, this is this um, SCAT RT, uh, RT thread throttling mechanism. It's default, typically default it's on. Uh, with many distributions, so you have some throttling there that after um, one 900 milliseconds of continuous running of a real-time thread, it will be suspended for a period. And, of course, this may be undesired uh, for a real-time thread. Uh, on the other hand, what we already heard about, that if you leave the guest under control in this scenario, it actually pulls infinitely, you may run into a system deadlock. So this is basically a trade-off you have to make depending on your workloads and depending on uh, how safe your system are. Maybe you can increase the period and leave the guest more time to finally do some idle uh, operation. Um, yeah, or you trust your guest. Could also be a scenario um, that it does an idle call and therefore break um, yeah, this infinite loop. Um, one thing to note is ISO CPUs manage the, the threads, but it doesn't, it doesn't manage um, the IRQ affinities, so you will end up with IRQs by default, first of all, also showing up on this ISO isolated CPUs, so these are tweening. Is this changed? It's, uh, but this is actually a kernel thing. IRQ balance is a service in user space, so you can, of course, you can tune this in IRQ balance uh, this way. But uh, the kernel by default has the, the mask set broadly. So you have to tune it somewhere. And IQ balance daemon is, of course, one way. You can have, I think it's already available, I think. There was a parameter in IQ balance to do this. Anyway, it has to be done, it has to be configured. Um, that's important to note. Well, there's more tuning uh, possible. You can play with SMI disabling and things like this. But it often depends, of course, what your latency requirements are. And, and if we heard about 40 microseconds this earlier, um, well, we are already happy with 100 microseconds with our setups. It really depends on what kind of guest you're running and how much effort you want to invest here. So the bad news on this is there's still a lot of tuning necessary on the compute node side. The good news is if you have more or less a Similar setup, a larger setup, you can replicate, of course, this tuning. Done once for one machine, replicated many times, you're fine. Uh, and, but the even better news is there are some frameworks, and I mentioned it before, I was discussing already the question regarding um, what you can do with um, C groups. Um, there's a tool by the OpenEMIA Linux um, project. Um, it's called PartRT, um, which starts basically partitioning, real-time partitioning using um, C groups and some other tricks like offlining, onlining CPUs to push the timers away and things like this. So on the first glance, it looks interesting, but we haven't done a full evaluation ourselves so far. Um, but at least it's a starting point. And if this is not something which is totally impossible right now without kernel patches, it might be a very interesting thing to follow on and maybe enhance this thing. It's, it's a simple Python script. Um, you can simply collect the information that you need for tuning the system partitioning way um, this way. It's one way, I would say. It's a good one, possibly. So next thing to look at is um, libvirt. Well, libvirt, um, this is also one thing that we learned this way again, um, is just a policy-free policy uh, management layer. 
Um, so it's just executing basically what has been told from the buff high management layers. Um, there is nothing really done inside libvirt um, to enable this kind of real-time things uh, besides basically executing what has been told. And the good news is that all required control we need for enabling this real-time setup is already upstream and uh, basically since version 1.2.13 available. That means for uh, real-time CPUs, um, we have uh, the pinning feature available. We have um, the availability of uh, setting the scheduling parameters um, of your vCPUs, like the policies and the priority. And we also have the ability um, to tell QEMU to memory lock the, the guest memory or the, the process memory, which is also required for real-time purposes. Regarding real-time networking, well, as we are looking at vHost user, we, of course, look for vHost user support. It's there. Um, you need um, the ability to, the host user basically enables um, that uh, the switch has full insight, the switching process has to have full insight into the guest uh, uh, memory because well, it has to execute the DMA request, the virtual DMA request um, that the guest is issuing. Um, and for this to enable, you have to set up specifically um, yeah, the memory, um, the guest memory according to some chemo partner parameters and support for this is now there. Uh, what you also need, of course, is the connecting um, the QEMO uh, networking backend for WebIO to this specific switch port, virtual switch port. And this is done with vhost user based on, on sockets. Well, you just have to identify basically which port you want to plug in the guest via um, some socket pass. Both available, problem solved, fine. The actual work that has to be done is now in OpenStack. But also there, surprisingly, many pieces are already there. Well, you have vCPU pinning available um, due to work in this area, also due to work on NUMA areas. Um, you have pCPU dedication even available so that only one guest is using one physical CPU. Um, and then there's a blueprint um, that uh, is basically proposing real-time extension, further real-time extension for, for OpenStack. Um, it showed up, well, I think, some three or four months ago uh, by Daniel Baranch. Um, and yeah, it's still in the discussion. Um, what it introduced basically is um, a new uh, flavor property. So flavor is um, a special yeah, uh, type in OpenStack for, for virtual machines, um, which is saying, okay, uh, this uh, virtual machine should be created with um, uh, real-time CPUs. You can tag this way, um, yeah, startup instances of virtual machines, but you can also tag images so that basically whenever you install, uh, instantiate this image, you get a real-time uh, image of this. Um, it depends on um, the pre-existing um, uh, flavor of, of uh, isolated uh, CPU, of, of dedicated CPUs. Um, so both have to be enabled, to uh, enable full real-time. And it basically triggers that QEMO does the memory locking and that um, the vCPUs are properly prioritized and um, yeah, policy, policy is properly applied to this. However, there are still some deficits and, and during the discussions and analytics of this thing, and specifically the past days, interestingly, um, we found some um, yeah, not that good optimal solution yet. So one thing, roundly the, the implementation, but also the specification is not really talking about priorities, which priority to use, which policy to use. It's just hard coding things. Um, that's probably fine, again, for most of the scenarios that you confine on one priority, but the currently picked one, priority one, is not really a fortunate one because a lot of things run at priority one by default um, in the, also in the real-time kernel. So you should at least pick something higher. Uh, and in the end, what you want is a control over this, a reasonable default, but still then the ability to control this. So this is an extension of the configuration format here. Another thing which is required and which was a discussion back and forth is um, regarding um, how many CPU masks do I need. So currently you tell Nova, okay, this is the set of CPUs you can run guests on. Uh, but it's not sufficient for this uh, because actually uh, what is run there is both the vCPUs as well as the event QEMO emulator threads. Uh, and we want to tell them apart. But um, Nova OpenStack has no knowledge about what is the other part, where can I put them as well. Um, and so we need a next mask, a second mask for this CPU mask, which is both telling us, so the one mask is to tell us which are the real-time CPUs, and the other mask is to tell us in one way or the other which is the remaining set of CPUs you can use for anything non-real-time when you are starting up a guest system. 
So based on the existing uh, blueprint, there is already some patch set available uh, where Chait, um, I can't pronounce his last name, sorry, um, was working on or is working on. Um, follow the link uh, to find a patch, uh, a series of four patches, I think, right now. Um, it implements, um, yeah, the, the existing blueprint um, over Git master of um, OpenStack. Which, um, it has not, this patch has been actually explicitly rejected recently uh, based on the argumentation that the blueprint is not yet accepted. Um, and that means regarding the timeline, because now the window is closed to accept blueprints which are of lower priority, obviously this is uh, falling in this category, we will miss the currently uh, window for Liberty, so the next release coming out for OpenStack, and the new target is Mitaka, so the next part one. And then only when the blueprint is merged, we also have the implementation, the chance to, implement, uh, to merge the implementation of it. So we are at Siemens currently integrating the existing patches in our deployment. We played with some other solutions before, um, learned a lot about OpenStack in this way, <laughs> um, and we want to, yeah, well, now uh, evaluate them and, and uh, basically also address what uh, we identified as uh, shortcomings. So we will contribute some um, information and some yeah, patches to the blueprint as well as to the code. So. So let's look at the networking aspect. Um, so depending on what your requirements are, if you are fine, basically what Neutron is the management layer for networking in, in OpenStack, what Neutron is doing with networks, um, that it's managed them in an IP way, um, you might be already fine with what comes out of the box. Um, we aren't fine with it because we have the requirement that our real-time networks are yeah, kind of special usually. Um, some of them, well, they are not managed by, by um, yeah, they're managed by, by guests, essentially, or external instances, nothing within the scope of OpenStack. Uh, so there are networks which are just there, and you should just use them. Um, and they may not even have TCP and IP at all. And Neutron is very much about network must to have an IP address, and unless you can't really create it. So there is a need to, uh, for a new kind of network type in, in, in Neutron. And that's basically what we are currently also implementing, um, this new type. Well, it introduced the concept of an unmanaged network, so IP-free, no DHCP in this, just blank. Um, what you will need in this context as well is an, an agent on the individual nodes, uh, which is aware of the connectivity of these networks. So where is this specific network available on which compute node? It may not be available on all networks because it's uh, a wiring issue. And if you have the knowledge and you can say, okay, if I want to instantiate a virtual machine, real-time virtual machine, which has to be connected to a real-time network blue, where is blue available? Okay, it's only on these nodes, then I will automatically deploy the machines on these nodes. That can be all done transparently for the user, but in the back end, something has to happen. So, Originally, I wanted to give some uh, nice numbers at this point. Um, sorry, the function is not really properly defined. Um, so we were, we were putting things together in the past weeks, and in the end, we were no, not long, not having a full uh, cut through of all the pieces, basically. And um, the idea is, in one point, to measure, basically, the round trip time you have um, over a network. Um, so you have the virtual machine doing some network intercommunication over this complete stack to another different machine and measuring the round trip time in the worst case case. So I will expect the numbers, well, a little bit later, probably in, in a few weeks, but right now it's um, a piece of, uh, a collection of pieces not yet really uh, capable of doing the full measurement. Okay, to summarize the results, um, well, there's a need to, to simplify real time for data centers um, and similar setups. Um, this simply means that we standardize the setups of these basic um, real-time scenarios, and there will always be special cases. Real-time is always about a lot of special cases, but at least this default thing should be run out of the box again, built on top of these. Um, and we really want to make the, the real-time management uh, manageable, the real-time machine manageable, accountable. So for do this, um, there's a need for a full real-time stack of, of uh, yeah, KVM and an open stack this is feasible. Um, the baseline is brand uh, We can use standard QEMO libvirt with these reference architectures, so no changes required in this area. There are some need for changes in Nova and Neutron and OpenStack. And yeah, the compute node tuning is still some area of improvement. 
where, well, probably most of the effort has to be spent on. What we want to work on in the near future, as I said, device time is currently um, excluded from the first setup, but uh, immediately if you discuss things, these requirements pop up again, so we'll probably look into this very soon. The major problem actually about device time is about managing the interrupts, uh, because interrupts on, on Linux is still a nasty thing to manage regarding affinity and also the real-time threat priority. Um, there are missing knobs to control this, and this, yeah, you can work around with hex, but basically you end up polling on, on interrupt popping up and then tuning them uh, afterwards, so this should be improved. Um, and then basically it becomes manageable also for, for the higher layers. Yeah, again, we want to look into this um, uh, part IT tool set to encode more of the knowledge and more of the default work into this area, uh, and basically, yeah, keep the knowledge this way um, yeah, in a code form available. And finally, last but not least, real-time device emulation is not completely fr uh, from the table. Um, it requires more work, but eventually it can work, it will work. Uh, we have use cases and uh, requirements for this, so in the future we will also address this, I suppose. Okay, thank you for your attention and open for further questions. Uh, I'm wondering that have you ever considered using content containers in your solution because as we know a kernel scheduler doesn't have the knowledge of RT tasking VMs and but for containers it won't be a problem and it also can have the um, have the advantage like isolation and imaginability like have wider thank you I'm not sure I fully got the question um, so is it about Para-virtualizing, uh, what's the discussion again about para-virtualizing the guests to enable this? Um, well, we, we had a, a, a proposal for this a long time ago, how this could be done, but we never really followed it at the point. Um, it's really about the trade-off, um, what this para-virtualization, um, in order to enable the insight into the guest, uh, what it is costing versus what it is buying you. Um, for this reference scenario, there is actually no need to have this. Um, because we assume the guest as a whole is one blob, it's real time, it's done. What's done inside, we can't do anything about it. Um, this is basically, I think, a feature which would enable more uh, compression, more uh, consolidation, uh, thicker yeah, uh, consolidation of, of the setup. Um, but I wouldn't go for this in the first steps. Let's get the basic things running and have a good feeling that it's manageable, and then we can look for optimization steps. Um, it's probably a nice area to play with, uh, but right now it's not of, of high priority. Hi, so I was just curious about um, Vihost user and, and Vihost net. Uh, you mentioned that Vihost user was uh, more manageable for you, and I'm curious what exactly are the management interfaces that you require, but uh, we can add them to VHostNet as well. Well, the, the first thing is that you are more flexible regarding what you do then, um, how you set up your system. Um, well, VHostNet in the kernel is just uh, rec um, responsible for uh, tuning or for, for communication with the guest, then you still need to attach um, a physical NIC to it. And you have a lot of complex paths going through uh, just to drive this physical NIC uh, to yeah, connect to switch, basically, uh, the physical packets to the virtual uh, NICs. Um, this is simply more complex because more kernel code is involved. You can probably tune it, um, but uh, we didn't look into this. The model, basically, between uh, for VHO as the user, they just have one thread running with real-time priorities on a specific core, Polling, basically, um, all queues that are involved in this is way simpler uh, from my point of view. I see. So it's not just about managing the Vihost net itself. It's also about managing the Linux host, the, the host Linux network the stack. The full real-time path from the physic to the virtual NIC. This has to be managed in some degree. Um, right, so the li Linux networking stack, yes, it does need some work for, for real-time hmm. tasks. I see. Thanks. So you mentioned uh, 
uh, I have latencies in uh, device assignment. Why does it matter if you are running some polling mode DPDK like stack in the guest? Um, for for DPDK, um, this is not an issue because DPDK is not doing uh, interrupts for the physics hardware. That's not a problem. Uh, the the issue is when you assign the physical device directly to the virtual machine. And the That's virtual machine setup. is not using DPDK. The virtual machine may use DPDK, but this is for us it's a black box in this model. You can do it, of course, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, how many CPUs are you assigning to the you know, DPDK side? I mean, um, currently only one. Only one? Well, we have one physical, well, the current setup is pretty simple. You have one physical NIC representing the real-time network, um, uh, putting it, uh, making it available for, for various guests. Well, I would say basically it's reasonable to have um, one core per physical interface. If you have a significant high um, throughput, you can have multiple physical NICs driven by one physical core if you like to. It really depends on what uh, data rates you have. But um, in our setups, the, the data rate actually is not that high. It's about the latency. It's not that much about um, the throughput. I suppose in NFV scenarios, it's really about a, a full uh, physical throughput you can get from the physical NICs, right. uh, and there you may possibly go for uh, one core per, per physical interface or so. Okay, and then you run that the DPDK process uh, as a real-time process or just a normal? Uh, we run it currently as it's tuning itself. Um, so we have, well, it's, it's using two cores. One is the management core, core zero, and the other thing is the data plane core. And it's tuning itself according to the default setups, um, so it ends up with a, with a um, well, due to the assignment basically on, a, on an isolated CPU with data plane, and there we get, yeah, we currently don't do it that much, but this is work in progress basically okay. to also revalidate what has to be done there. It's, it's it, Basically, it's the same scenario you have with a virtual CPU thread. It has to be above, real-time-wise, above anything un, unimportant on that core, um, it can't dominate the core completely, so there has to be a need to reschedule it once in a while. Um, so this has to be tuned somehow, that the CPU is not starving, or the system is starving this way. Uh, but ideally, it has the core uh, completely. So one day when we have complete full no edge set, it would be ideal just to run the thread there and leave the CPU alone, from okay. that point of view. Is that the DPDK, uh, OBS DPDK or just the DPDK? It's just a default DPDK. Okay, not, you have no it doesn't version. have uh, the OBS part. I'm not aware what actually is the difference between both, so I'm currently just looking at the, the default uh, DPDK. Okay. okay. Hello. Hey, uh, just a comment about uh, no hertz, that you, you know the no hertz kernel feature to disable the tick. Uh, you said that you didn't uh, find it useful or you improve your numbers? Well, we had two issues with it. First of all, it's still one second tick uh, interruption anyway. So it's not complete, no headset. Uh, well, it's maybe no scheduler tick, but it's still happening something once in a while. Um, right. And the other thing, it actually was an older version, so there was still the problem that Rick was describing, that the interruption were actually more frequent than just one once per second. Uh, right, but 1,000 is different than uh, one second. But what I'd like to say is that what we have found is, uh, for the host, it seems to be always useful. And in the guest, um, it depends on the workload. Mm -hmm. um, cyclic test uh, is able, depending on how you, you run cyc cyclic test, it's able to trigger some uh, worse cases. Mm -hmm. But for DPDK, as far as uh, I think, um, it seems to be always useful. OK. Right. Well, we will try it again. Yeah, definitely. Hi. So you have some uh, recommendations for the host, how to tune the host, the, the Linux kernel, the BIOS, and things like that. But as you described, QME also plays a big role in the latency. So do you have any recommendations for the factors in QMU, like a particular type of devices or uh, the QMU thread, maybe pinning that or, or any of that? Do you have any recommendations for that? 
well, currently the best thing, well, we have to have the partitioning. So at the point currently we have a QEMO exit on our real-time guest course we have lost. That's the current model. If you uh, would like to include it, then we are back basically in, in making QEMO real-time capable. There are some steps. We have we started to break up the locking, so certain data planes in QEMO emulation can actually be now split out. You have multiple I.O. threads, the possibility for this. You can also tune them to a certain degree. But in the end, the device model has to be capable of running independent of the big QEMO lock. Um, and there are not many of these. Uh, two, one, three, I don't know. Um, so this is not working out of the box, definitely. Once we have such thing, the scenario basically remains the same. All the rest will remain workload for non-real-time force. And individual things, individual devices with individual I.O. threads or with a pool of I.O. threads for real-time tuned can then be split out, can be put on probably dedicated cores as well, real-time capable cores, and then do the work. And then you may possibly accept certain um, user space QEMO exits from your guest for these targeting these specific um, real-time capable emulated devices. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a special case, but in most cases, I think that the scenario where you are doing a network I.O. is fine for the real time we have currently in mind. There are basically the legacy scenarios where this comes into play. So if you have guest, pre-existing guest machines, which are expect that certain devices on physical hardware be, will be behaving deterministically also in the virtual environment. Uh, there, basically, you have to look into this and possibly enable it. We had a scenario like this. It was presented, I think, two years ago uh, about an RTC, a PC RTC a clock, uh, which had to be enabled for real time. This would be such a candidate legacy, I would say. Okay. Thanks. Please take the mic. Are there any plans to integrate real-time profile in TUND config anytime in the future, like one of the profile options? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Are there any plans to include real-time as a profile for TUND? TN. Oh. Oh, okay. great. What what kernel version is that required? Cool. Thanks. Hmm? I I did get that conversation, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I would like to repeat, but anyway. Yeah. That's good. The question I think was uh, whether we should use, shouldn't we use TuneD to do the tuning? And I was telling him that we've already got a start on a TuneD profile called TuneD Profile Real Time. Mm -hmm. And right now the main thing it does is CPU and IRQ isolation. So, okay. I didn't mean to keep that private. Thank you. Another question? Otherwise, thank you all and well. We have a break now.